in looking at a lot of economic studies and in looking at some of the data, um, studies tracking the economic studies of poor households in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America suggest that somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of households in a given country escape poverty over a three to ten year period by capturing some opportunities, whether that's finding a new job and uh, starting a micro business or other things. Um, but the problem is that the net change isn't that much because almost a similar number of people fall back into poverty due, mm -hmm. due to a variety of economic setbacks or shocks. And those shocks can be both positive and negative. And the question we actually asked ourselves is, what's the role in financial services in that equation? And rather than focus in the end on a product effect, can we actually focus on a poverty effect by understanding how financial services help people buffer themselves against the shocks that happen and mm -hmm. how they actually help them capture opportunities? And we began to look at some of the data and we came up with a couple of things that we thought were really important. One was the financial access and financial services are really powerful in their ability to help people manage shocks and take advantage of opportunities. And that the other thing was that people needed a variety of financial services rather than access to any one service. Hmm. And so if we take some of the history around microfinance, I guess I would believe that while credit is important, it was simply insufficient in and of itself to manage right. all the things that poor people needed to do. And one of the barriers that stands out really dramatically is that um, there is a real economic cost to transactions that poor people do. And unless you can overcome that in a sustainable way, we can't imagine that you will actually reach down with financial services to poor people. The cost of those transactions are just too expensive unless you can get them in some kind of digital format. Mm -hmm. And digital transactions solve two problems. One, they fundamentally lower the cost of transactions over, um, over cash and even over some of the best um, IT systems, the most efficient delivery mechanisms. Once you move a transaction to be digital, it radically drops the cost structure um, dramatically. The second thing it does is it begins to shift from a variable cost structure to a fixed cost structure. So you're paying for the overall cost of the infrastructure mm. required, but you can distribute that over thousands and millions of transactions. The problem with seeing someone in a banking environment is that every time you see them, it costs you money. And when, we, when I look back at even my experience of, of running a, a bank focused mm -hmm. on low-income people, we were constantly overwhelmed by the number of people that were in the branches. Mm. Now, you can do that if you're offering credit because the margins are big enough that it's worth all that, all that face time you have with the customer. But when you're talking about saving services or payment services or other kinds of services, the margins aren't the same and the income streams are not the same. And it becomes really, really difficult to overcome those transaction costs. If we look at some of the research, poor people want to do a lot of transactions. Again, if you get a portfolio right. of the poor in other places, it's not that they want to see you once a month. They actually want to do a lot of transactions. So the very thing poor people want to do is the very thing that suppliers find most difficult to supply. And if you can move into digital services, they tend to overcome that. I also think one of the problems we have, Larry, in our space in financial services is that there is this huge asymmetry of information about poor people. We know mm -hmm. a huge amount about agronomy. We as an industry and as development experts know a lot about um, some of the diseases poor people face and some of the transmission mm -hmm. ways they go and a lot of epidemiology around that. We know very little in a structured, systematic, data-driven way about the financial behavior of poor people. We have mm -hmm. a lot of work that's been done anthropologically with, the, with portfolios of the poor and others that are descriptive, but we don't actually have the data to understand how we would design financial products 
and deliver mm -hmm. them in a way that are meaningful and useful at a co at a price point poor people can afford that address the real issues that they have. And so one of the things that we get excited or I get excited about with data, and, and we saw it in my previous life as well, is once the transaction becomes digital, you begin to understand the behavior of poor people in a way you didn't before. And does that let you design some products or services that integrate with the household level needs in a way you couldn't do before? We're not trying to take away the human element. We're just trying to provide a way that puts that, that recognizes the economic barriers that are there, that mm -hmm. recognizes the asymmetry of information that exists between buyers and suppliers of this, um, and understands the understands that those fundamental things, unless we can figure out how to address them, are never going to actually result in large scale numbers of people being included. But then if you can compress that transaction cost, I think it frees up all other kinds of ways to begin to interact with low-income people um, that raise both ability and awareness and um, an understanding of what drives usage, what kinds of products poor people want, um, and how we actually deliver that in a way, in a format, and in, in my case, a price point uh, that actually works with low-income people. Let's think creatively and prudentially around um, who can provide payment services. Is that the same as providing banking services? Um, what are the contagious risks that that creates? And so we're actually doing some work around the data and the research and working with policymakers to say, what are the risks of opening up this market? Um, because one thing is that I think it's going to be hard to offer a full suite of financial services profitably in its own right. I think we're going to have to leverage other infrastructure, as you and I have mm -hmm. talked about and looked at over the years. Mm -hmm. um, but that needs different players in the market. So what is those right. different players? What's the role of retailers? What's the role of M&Os? What's the role of agro-dealers in rural areas? How do we leverage mm -hmm. that infrastructure? And then what are the prudential risks and what are some of the contagious risks that are associated with that? And how do we, how do we think about their role as part of this? So if we think about, in other areas, the development of um, communication systems and large-scale network effects in different industries, you know, there's always a question around, do the same people who own the communication channel or the platform need to own all the content that flows across it? And mm -hmm. can you think about different ways that different kinds of industries and providers would connect themselves onto um, different platforms or different ways that poor people might access financial services. Is there a way to allow a poor person to get a variety of access to services without the assumption that it all needs to be provided by one kind of entity? Mm -hmm. So one thing that we're wrestling with right now is the foundation, and we're we're really we're going to put some money into research and looking at it more closely. Is like how do saving-led groups? get connected into this? Right. What is the implication right. of those economics to people that are reaching down and effectively doing so um, to really, really poor women um, in some of the most remote areas of the earth? I think we are working really diligently on a measurement plan right now, Larry, and it's not done. But I can mm -hmm. tell you some of the elements are it won't just be number of users. Mm -hmm. or it won't be just number of people signed out, or it won't be just number of transactions. Um, I think availability of a service is not the same as access. Right. And access means that it actually works for me as a poor person in my household um, mm -hmm. for what my challenges are. So I think we're going to try and look at measurement in, at three levels. At one level, we're going to look at the outputs that... Um, that our grants do, that the impact of others are having, and the outputs are the kinds of things like number of transactions, number of providers, and, um, number of people signed up, number of types of products that are being used. Um, 
But then I think we're going to move to other levels, which is at the outcome level. So what do those outputs actually generate, and what kinds of outcomes for poor people are we expecting out of that? So mm -hmm. um, are they better at managing shocks? Are they more likely to um, have different kinds of uh, disposable income effects or um, other kinds of effects on the household? And so there's been some studies done recently that, that should be published relatively soon showing that even being a member um, of a more efficient payment system, and, and this is a mobile money system, um, that when a shock happened at the household level, people who were members of, of this mobile money scheme, um, even six months later, did not have a noticeable decrease in, in consumption. But mm. people who were not part of that system actually had a measurable decrease in consumption. Um, and then the third level is we're actually going to try and do some impact measurement, which is really about inclusion and the poverty impact. And I think you'll see mm -hmm. that that's an area that we're really interested in. And, and we think that financial services express themselves in health issues, in agricultural right. issues, right. in education issues. Those are the issues that poor people care about, um, in gender equality issues. And so yep. we're going to try and look at it holistic at the household level in how do financial services help low-income people cope? How do they have effect on education and, um, and, and agriculture um, and, and gender equality issues? And we're going to be working with both private and public sector providers um, and, and multilaterals and bilaterals to say, what are the poverty impact measures? How do we get this right? And how do we make sure that what we do um, really helps at the household level? Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that from all the time I've spent in Africa that's really clear to me is if we get it wrong, we can actually have negative impact mm -hmm. on the household right. level. I, I want to actually see that at the household level, this is making a real life, a real difference in the lives of poor people. And mm -hmm. Uh, so that's what drives me to be here, and I think that's what drives the FSP team, and that's is is a key element uh, of our strategy.